Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the No Easy Way Out podcast. My name is Tony Nash and we are coming to you as always from the Armory in beautiful downtown Owasso, Michigan, home to my company, AZ Business Solutions. And this episode is brought to you by this mug. Not this mug, but rather what's inscribed. That exact mug. Oh, okay, okay. What's inscribed on the mug. <laughs> and that is AZ Business Solutions. AZ offers many services in the digital marketing space. And our most popular service is... One of our most popular services. One of our most popular. Yeah. It's not our most popular? I would say, I'd say it's one of our most popular. One I think our most popular. popular is video production. Oh, okay. okay. Just because we have these two geniuses right here. All right. Yeah. All All right. Right. Take some credit. Take some credit. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Web design. Web design... Can you afford to invest in a website that looks great but doesn't build your profits and your brand? Why invest in a pretty website if it doesn't generate leads and turn browsers into buyers? Good question. Yeah, right? That's what <laughs> that's everybody's answer. asking, right? Yeah, that's what people are asking me on the streets. Do you know at AZ, you can have both. You don't say. Yeah, a beautifully designed website and a successful one. Well, that would be nice. Yeah. Definitely. AZ looks at your business, your industry, and your demographic to design a site that appeals to your target market. And we don't just design for the computer screen. We understand that today's website needs to look great and perform well on a variety of devices. In fact, in today's world, more people will view websites on mobile devices than on desktop monitors. I believe the most recent statistic is in 2020, in 2020, over 80% of web traffic was found on mobile devices, iPads, iPhones. That's crazy. I believe it. That's crazy. That's the world we live in today. Yes, sir. So contact AZ today for a cutting edge design that is user friendly, search engine friendly, and optimized for mobile devices and compels to your clients to take action. Wow, that was good, Jordan. You're getting a little bit worse every week, but we appreciate your <laughs> effort there. All right, well, thank you guys. I hope all, uh, everything's going well. I wanna introduce you to today's guest. Today's guest is a proud Corona High School grad, a former Alaskan, and they currently the principal at Springvale Christian School in Owasso, the one, the only, my bearded brother, Joe Vondolowski. Joe, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Tony, if you remember. Uh, when, as soon as I knew I was coming here, I messaged you on Facebook. I said, hey, I want to get on that podcast. And he did. What do he I need did. to do? Yes. You know, <laughs> we have like seven fans, and Joe is one of them, and we appreciate that. He said that one of his goals moving back to the great state of Michigan was to get on the No Easy Way Out podcast. So we like to see that you're setting lofty goals for yourself, and you made it, man. You're here. It's We're a big day. It's a big day for us, too. We're excited to have you here. Now, uh, I met Joe, man, back in the I actually met you through your brother, John. John and I interned together at Emmanuel Baptist Church. We lived in an apartment. I didn't know John very well, but if you go from not knowing John super well to being his roommate, that's a big transition in life. I was his roommate in college, so I know a little <laughs> bit about that. Yeah, but you had a whole lifetime to get to know the guy. <laughs> True. He's, he's a unique fellow, but I got to know him through you. I can't remember the exact time we went, but I do remember, and uh, we'll talk about this later, I do remember a little bit of meeting back in the day on the Ker the Kerwood three-on-three courts. I don't know if you remember yeah, that. You guys okay. had the bruisers out there. So yeah, That was an important time in my life. Those were, those were the big days back then. So well, how are you guys doing today? Everyone doing all right? Doing really good. Everyone? It's the uh, sixth anniversary of AZ Business Solutions. Is that correct? It is the sixth. Yesterday was yesterday the was. sixth anniversary, March 1st. Was the sixth anniversary studio audience round of applause? Sweet, yeah. <laughs> six years, man. Exciting time. All right. uh, and yeah. we got a cake here. We got some for cake. The six year anniversary. That, I'm try it right now. Let's see. Let's tell the audience how it tastes. Uh, my wife is. We we had a video shoot all day yesterday uh, at Memorial Hospital, and we get back and I look in my office and there's a cake and some balloons, and the staff is sitting here just like chomping at the bit, wanting to cut the cake. And so we cut the cake yesterday, but that was very thoughtful, Danica. So thank you yeah, for doing Danica. that. Way to way to look out for it. Zach, what's the verdict? How's so the cake? So it's got the really sweet frosting on top. It's uh -huh. not like the cool whip type. Okay. What's, um, so what's the name for that frosting? There's a sugar frosting. Oh, <laughs> there's some kind of a name for it. I don't know what it's called. A little bit of sprinkles on there. It's white cake instead of chocolate cake. I yeah. like that. You like that? I like that a lot. All right. I'm going to go 7.2 on this one. A 7.2, honey. That's good. Zach's a picky guy. <laughs> he went 7.2 on the cake. So 7.2. Well, I'm looking forward to having some of that later. Um, so yesterday, we spent the day at Memorial Hospital, which was, uh, which was a lot of fun. But I'm really excited about a project that we're working on. We're, we're going to be releasing this week. We've been working on it for a while. Many of you might remember 
we did a video back at the beginning of of quarantine which was almost a year ago now which is hard to believe that we've been at this thing for a year you'd think we would have learned a little bit more about it by now but anyways we did a video called owasso strong and it got like a hundred thousand views and uh kind of went locally viral and uh, just something to kind of encourage our community and uh, it turned out to be something really good for our community so we just have been working on the last several weeks owasso strong the sequel and that's going to be coming out maybe today or tomorrow and uh it's pretty exciting uh, you guys have got a chance to, i know jordan because he edited it but have you got to see the final cut yet zach uh i believe so yesterday right you, you, saw, you saw the final cut we talked about one more tweak that we're maybe oh, maybe today. i haven't then yeah 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 but basically just kind of shows kind of the impact that COVID has had on our local community uh and then kind of the call to action to support small business right now zach's going in for bite number two house bite number two just one bite everyone knows the rules <laughs> <laughs> Which means two. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Huh. Okay, so anyways, be looking for that. Owasso Strong, the sequel, we'll be bringing that out this week. We're also excited. You maybe have seen driving around our new little van brought to you by Agnew Graphics. We got our van all wrapped up, and so... That looks sweet. It really yeah, does. It turned out yeah. really good, yeah. You know, it's loud. You can't. We talked about whether we should get a billboard or whether we should do a van. So we thought a van is like a driving billboard. So right. we're doing these video shoots all over the state, sometimes even out of state, and we're kind of loading up equipment in our own personal vehicles. And we thought, you know what, this would be good to get something that we can go around in. And so if you see it, give us a honk. Let us know you're seeing us out there and we'll be happy to see you. But um, I, I really want to spend a few minutes talking about something that uh, was a really painful moment in my life. We're going we're gonna to come in close right now. We're going to talk about our feelings here. Uh, we or you? I'm going to talk about our feelings, and then we can all discuss how I need to just get over it. We'll talk so, about your feelings. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, he said, I'm going to talk about our feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Tony. How does that make you feel, guys? <laughs> so, to that. many of you know, I also, uh, in my spare time, coach uh, high school basketball. Mm. And uh, we had a, 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 an odd season. Obviously, it's 2020. Now, our conference that we're in, the Michigan Association of Christian Schools, allowed us to play an entire season mask free we had a 15 game season uh, started back in december um we had fans we had the whole nine yards and so the kids got to have somewhat of a normal season although things were a little different because some of the schools did allow fans some didn't uh sometimes the officials were wearing masks sometimes they weren't sometimes we did a jump ball sometimes we didn't do a jump ball so i wouldn't quite call it a normal season but we had more of a normal season than a lot of kids in the state were able to and we set out on day one of our first practice, we set out to win a state championship. Actually, Zach, you were there. We actually practiced on day one. We got a ladder and some scissors, and we cut down a net on day one of, of our practice. You did. Everybody had a net, and all year we kind of talked about getting to the state championship. We felt like we had the tools to get there, had a good season, got the number two seed in the, in the tournament, and uh, then uh, we went into the tournament. We won our semifinal game. And this last weekend, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we won our, our quarterfinal game, which propelled us to the semifinals, which would have been last Friday, uh, February 26th, I think, just Sounds for good. context, because this might be, not be last Friday while you're watching this. Uh, and we're going ready to go to practice on Thursday. My son on Wednesday is telling me he's having some really severe stomach pains. And this is my son, is our he's our best defensive player, but he's our second leading scorer. And he is probably as if not more passionate about the game of basketball than anyone on our team and he's telling me he's having these stomach aches so of course as a dad i'm like just take some pepto rub some dirt in it you'll be fine well this goes on for like 24 to 30 hours and he's still hurting and so i'm like and he's describing where it's at lower right side i'm like oh boy here we go so i'm like well we're gonna have to take him to the doctor just to rule out that it's not his appendix and literally in the doctor's office she lays him down Within 30 seconds, she touches down on his right side, and he he kind of you know squirms. She goes, "You got to go to the ER." So we take him to the ER, and of course they find out he's got appendicitis. He's got to have his appendix removed. He can't play. So he's devastated. He's crying. So as a dad, I'm like, "Oh, this poor kid. You know, I'm feeling sorry for him. I know how hard he's worked." As a coach, I'm thinking, "All right, what's the new game plan that we have going into this thing?" Uh, and so we're trying to think it all through and. I literally asked the doctor, I'm like, tell me, doc, can he play? I was like, can, can we, can, can we, is it going to kill him if we push the surgery off till next week? Like, is this thing going to burst inside of him? And because he's asked me like, dad, I just want to play. I'll play through the pain. And so I'm like, I got to rule out. Like, if you're telling me he's going to just be hurting 
okay, he can play through the pain. But if it's gonna hurt, like if it's gonna if he's gonna die or damage. right, like we're not gonna do that. And the doctor said, yeah, his appendix is four times the size it should be right now, so we got to get him in right away. So he didn't get to play. He did have the surgery and was able to come to the game Friday night. We win the semifinal game. We're on our way to the state championship. We get to the state championship game against the number one seed, a team that we had split with in the regular season. Our school rival. Our school rival. The team that we beat in the 2017 state championship yes, was Zach's team there. Yes, we did. Zach made an incredible hype video. I mean, that thing was awesome. It got the guys all hyped up. We stayed Friday night after we watched film. I stayed up all night, literally slept like an hour. I watched the game film like five times. I knew what the game plan was. We went in with some confidence. And it was a close game back and forth. It comes down to the final minute. We're up one. Or, uh, I'm sorry, we're up two. One of their players with about 40 seconds hits a three to put them up by one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get a chance at the end to kind of draw up a play. We turn the ball over. We lose the game by one point. Lost the state championship by one point. So <laughs> it's a heartbreak. Now, now I got a dozen kids emotional, you know, crying. And uh, my son's crying in his wheelchair, uh, and it's hurting his stomach to cry. And you're trying to think of the right things to say as a coach. You're kind of feeling it for them, but you you know wanting to pick him up. But man, that was tough. You guys were at the game. What were your thoughts of the game? I thought it was an awesome game. I thought it was you know they kept it real close the whole time. Back and forth. You back could, and forth. Yeah, you could tell that all of those boys had a lot of just passion playing, and they were just you know each team really wanted it so bad. You, oh yeah, you could tell. Yeah. And really, I thought fire was going to pull it, man. And yeah. In the last, you know, couple minutes, I was like, oh, they're ahead. They got this. And it then, seemed like it was being set up for that magic moment. Yeah. You know, like, really yeah. like everything was falling into place. Like, we're going to just, it just kind of felt like we're going to have the game winner here and we're going to yeah. celebrate. And but we were filming it. We had, yeah, you know, we had multiple some sweet had the camera crew like, there. Like yeah. The yeah. 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 Either way, it was going to be a heartbreak for either team. For, yeah. Yeah. And it just so happened to be you guys. <laughs> just so happened to be us. Well, Zach is a former alumnus, someone who got to the big dance. You, you, we twice. went to twice, lost it the first year in a heartbreak, but then came back the second year, went undefeated in Division mm-hmm. Two, and then won it pretty handily against that same school. Yeah. What's your feeling about how that all went down? Well, you know, winning the championship the year after we lost the championship was so much sweeter, obviously. It was yeah. almost as sweet as this cake here with the sugar frosting, but <laughs> um, you, know, you can't beat that. So, yeah, I think it's going to be good. You know, if the kids work hard and they get their – um, you know, again next year it'll be good for him. Yeah, so hear that, guys. Work hard, come back now. Unfortunately, your brother was a senior. Also, and unfortunately, you don't have a Joey on your team. We don't have a Joey on our team. <laughs> well, you don't know what to true. do. You just pass the ball to Joey. <laughs> That's true. We don't have that yet. So, what do you guys are going to have to step up and be a Joey? Well, listen. If you guys are watching, I know some of you guys actually watch my podcast, but I just want to say, as a coach, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the effort. Every single guy that hit the court and the guys on the bench gave maximum effort. It was not a a loss because we didn't play hard. Or because we, you know, we weren't there. It's just one of those things that could have gone either way. I mean, a one-point game could go mm-hmm. either way. So, anyways, big weekend, tough, tough loss. But you know, second place is is a is a life lesson. I mean, that's always gonna it's gonna produce in you something. Hopefully, it produces a little hunger in you to maybe uh, step up in other areas of your life. So, but I enjoy coaching. And since then, these guys have been sending. We have a group chat. And these guys, it just so happens we're in our missions conference this week at church. And these guys are sending like Bible verses every morning. They're talking about, hey, God's going to use this in our lives. And so to see those guys recognizing God working in their lives, even beyond this adversity, is, is really, really cool. So more important to me even than winning a basketball game. So anyways, enough about that. Enough about that moment. We thought we'd give that a little enough bit of time. about your feelings. But yeah, you know, it was a tough weekend. I, I don't want to watch sports for a while. But speaking of sports, you guys hear what happened to Tiger Woods? I don't. You didn't hear what happened to Tiger Woods, Jordan? Did you hear? I, I heard a little bit about it, yeah. Joe, you heard about this? I heard he got in a car accident. Wow. Hurt his leg. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, he got into a big car accident, rolled his car, hurt his leg really bad. He's going to be out for a while. Uh, they, they thought at first it might have been a fatal car crash, but over the weekend, a bunch of the guys uh, from the whatever tournament they're in, I don't watch a lot of golf, but they all wore red and black shirts in his honor. So I thought that was kind of cool. But, you know, Tiger's a bit of a controversial character. You either love him or you hate him, but he's undeniably a great golfer. Oh, yeah. So anyways, well, enough about all that. So let's get back to our guest over here who's just uh, been waiting patiently over there as we kind of reminisce a little bit. But Joe, tell us a little bit. So I, you know, right now you're currently the principal at Springvale Christian School, another great school in our area. Um, and tell us a little bit about Springvale Christian School and what your role is there. Uh, so Springvale has been around for 75 years in Owasso. Wow. 
Yeah. I, I didn't realize that. Right. Um, I remember it because I went to Morris in eighth and ninth grade and my friend, my good friend, Rod Baker, uh, transferred there in his ninth grade year. So throughout the years, it's been primarily a nine through 12 school mm -hmm. boarding program, although they do have some local students. But just recently, th three years ago, they decided to transition to a classical Christian model. Okay. And that's what uh, drew me in. I I'm committed to that. I believe in that. So well, tell us a little bit about a cla what does a classical Christian education model look like? Right. So to use an example, it models uh, an edu it's an education model. If we were to apply it to basketball, the first lesson in basketball is not the three point shot. Correct. Right. <laughs> what, what's the first thing you have a student who's never picked up a basketball do? Probably dribble the dribble ball. Dribble the yeah. ball a yeah. lot, right? Yeah. Over and over, dribble drills, yeah. defensive shuffles. And so our education model is based on uh, what we know, how we know anybody learns anything. The first thing that you need to establish is a foundation yeah. of basic facts. So in our grammar school, which is our K through five program, students are memorizing vast amounts of information. You know, your, your young children can memorize a Bible passage faster than you can. Oh, for sure. And so they're memorizing dates of history. They're singing a lot of songs, chanting, learning grammar, studying Latin. Uh, then as they oh, become wow. junior hires, uh, they start to realize, they start to, the way God has naturally made them, they start to question things. Why? How come? Why do I have to do that? And so we build on that way that God has made them in their development to start seeing the interconnectedness with the other disciplines. And so the things that we're learning in history, we tie to math and music and art and, and show them the relatedness ultimately with the Bible, always coming back mm. to the scripture. And then the grammar stage is the state championship, or I'm sorry, yeah. the rhetoric stage is yeah. the state championship. This is where we take all the, all the hours in the gym dribbling, mm -hmm. all the practicing free throws, all the practicing setting picks and running mm -hmm. that final play. So the, their rhetoric stage of their um, 10th, 11th, 12th grade year is one spent creating their own statement of faith, uh, giving a lot of speeches, a lot of debate, and taking everything that they've learned and applying it to the issues of the day yeah. so that they can, th we say, we are not teaching you what to think. We are teaching you how to think. How to think. Uh, also, a component of the program is the great books. We study the great books of Western civilization, the books that have stood the test of time. And so we read hard mm -hmm. books, and then we look at four worlds. So there's four worlds in our logic and rhetoric school. As we read great books who are dealing with the big truths of, of life, what is truth, what is beautiful, what is good, what is good government, mm -hmm. uh, what is wrong, mm -hmm. uh, we look at the world of the author, what's the author saying about it. Mm -hmm. Then we look at the world of the common culture, what, is our common, what does our culture today say about this topic? And then we ask the student, what do you think? And then always we go to, what does the Bible say about it as the, the final voice about any topic. Yeah. Well, I think that's critically important today because it appears as you talk to a lot of adults, <laughs> that people don't know how to think for themselves. Correct. They, uh, they've just been taught to accept what you've been told and not to, uh, process that and come up with your own conclusions. And so teaching them at that young age, you know, and, and I like how it goes in the stages of where they're at in their life and the, the things that's going on in their mind. Um, but how long have you been directly involved in this type of educating? Yeah, I got married in 01. And as soon as I knew uh, I was going to have kids, I sought out what is the best education there is in the world. Yeah. And so I've traveled the country and been involved in homeschooling and private school and public school and charter schools and off the grid schools. And I'm absolutely convinced that classical Christian education is the the best education there is. It's the education I want for my children. I always am thinking I, I want my children to stand on my shoulders. I want them to have the education I wish I would have gotten. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's it. So, well, tell me about some of the like the result. Like, what have you seen as a difference in students that have gone through this and 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 their behavior and what they go on to do in life? How has it affected them into adulthood that you've noticed? Sure. Well, uh, my, my journey has been a lot of taking 
Uh, a lot of what a lot of Christian schools do is they get stuck in the grammar stage. Mm-hmm. So even as a senior, you're looking up the bold faced words and writing down the definitions and memorizing those for the test. Yeah. And that's really the grammar stage of education. And so um, one of the things that I've been involved with is taking Christian schools and transitioning them. Mm-hmm. And it's qu- quite a task undertaking, not just um, in bringing in different curriculum, but changing the philosophy of a school changing the way teachers teach, the way teachers think about learning. And so um, our classrooms in our rhetoric school are not desks in a row, they're Mm -hmm. tables. And so we sit around a table, we read a classic work of Western civilization, and then we come up with big questions and the teacher acts as a guide. They don't, they're not the sage on the stage a lot, uh-huh. sitting up in front of the class lecturing, giving information, information, information. Right. Uh, they've read the book, and now there's questions, and the students lead the questions, and then the teacher guides them to keep them, uh, you know, keep hmm. them within the bounds so they don't get lost on rabbit trails. But, and so they're having conversations sharpening each other. Iron sharpens iron. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, some, some basic things that, that we try to teach, at least I, I teach my own children, is, um, you know, shake somebody's hand, give yeah. a firm handshake, look yeah. them in the eye. Yeah. You know, that makes a big impression. Lost art. Yeah. Makes a big impression on people, but. Although we're not allowed to shake hands these days, but right. it's still a good thing to Fist do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we, we still teach our kids to, to shake the hands, but yeah, a lot of people are not comfortable with that for some reason right now, so. So yeah. as, as far as results, you know, I would. Um, a lot you can be the greatest school in the world but a lot depends on the home when dad yeah. loves the detroit lions son loves the detroit lions right when da- when dad loves basketball and his head coach yeah son is in the wheelchair balling his eyes out when he can't play <laughs> right interesting no, i think that sounds really good and like i said i think the idea that <clears throat> not the idea but the philosophy to teach kids to think for themselves even if their thought isn't right but right. teach them to go through that process of having a thought seeing what that thought results in and then allowing you to then formulate an opinion or a fact so or a theory. the way that I grew up and, you know, I just know what I know and what my experience was, I was taught to believe certain things and, and this is how things were. But then I, as an 18 year old, I went to a public university and it was just kind of like, whoa, wow. Yeah. I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't have the tools, uh, to be in it, to be yeah. healthy in that situation. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, well, I know that uh, Springvale is a, a little bit of a unique school. It's not a traditional yeah. school. You, you mentioned earlier, I was going to ask you if you have local students. You do have some local students. We do. But you have students coming from all over the place. What's the farthest distance that you have a student from? Oregon. Oh, Oregon, okay. Oregon, yeah. So you have students that come here, they live here for the semester, you have dormitories, you have staff that I'm assuming stays on? We do, we have deans and you know, it's really a 24 seven experience because after school's over, we have activities in the community and all over the state really, that all of our dorm students are involved in. And then all of the local students have access to if they want to come attend. Yeah. And what, uh, and you said it's it's 9th through 12th or 7th K-12. through 12th? K-12. We okay. started a grammar school okay. last year. Okay. So we're in year two of our grammar school. Um, so, yeah, okay. K-12. And then what would you say is your mix of how many local students compared to, uh, I don't know, you call them transient students? Yeah. Or? Um, we probably have 25% of our students are dorm students and the other 75 are oh, okay. local. Okay. So it's mostly local market. Okay. Very good. And you, this is your first year as the principal? Yeah, I was uh, in Alaska, living off the grid, teaching in a basically a one-room schoolhouse in southeast Alaska, and um, a new superintendent came on board in that district, a lady out of California who was far <laughs> left of left, and you know, life, <laughs> life's too short not yeah. to love what you do, Yeah. and so I started looking for another job and saw an ad, a wasso, I never thought I'd come back here. Yeah, uh, how long were you gone? 20 years, 20 yeah. years. I remember so. I got a text from you that I think I just found my dream job. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then I actually talked to the folks over at Springvale because we were utilizing their facilities for our sports, our, their gym for our basketball games. And so I talked to a couple of their guys and put in a good word for you, yeah. lied through my teeth. Yeah, and So you're that. welcome for that. Yeah, yeah. A couple of you guys did that. I owe you a solid. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Well, we're glad to have you back. In the, so, so let's talk about Alaska. Yeah. So you were 
my wife loves like they have all these Alaska shows on right. TV, The Final Frontier or whatever, and she is so intrigued by that lifestyle of just kind right. of living remotely off the grid. That does absolutely nothing for this guy. I just yeah. had to be honest with me. Like to me, yeah. I I'm such a socialite. Like I want to be around people and I want to be around traffic and I want to be around noise and uh, even if I'm in my office trying to focus, if it's dead silent, I can't get anything done. So right. I got to turn on like. Stephen A. Smith and Max Kellerman screaming at each other wow. in order to focus. If I'm reading a book, I need something loud happening in the background. Wow. It's just the way my mind works. So the idea of being in a place where it's just quiet and peaceful all the time, you know, I can enjoy that for a couple of days, but you know, it doesn't. So, so what was that like living in Alaska? That's well, Heidi, my wife and I have been quite committed to providing uh, experiences for our children yeah. uh, to prepare them for adulthood. Um, we were in Southern Oregon and we're involved in all the travel ball sports and horseback riding and uh, everything that you're, you know, most, most parents do. Um, and then this opportunity came up. Heidi and I uh, have a consulting business mm -hmm. and we can basically live anywhere in the world that has internet. Yeah. And so I was at a job fair with my brother uh, hiring teachers, uh, employees, and I just wandered by the Alaska booth and <laughs> struck up a conversation with this superintendent who was just a fishing guide, good old boy, <laughs> kind of uh, one thing led to another. He said, hey, we'd love to have you. I have a three, two-story, three-story lodge on the ocean. Uh, you have to take a float plane in there. There's no roads. It's oh a one-room schoolhouse. Um, your kids would love it. There's whales and it's the best fishing corner in the world. And, uh, okay. So I called my <laughs> wife thinking, you know, no Hard way, pass. no way. Hard. <laughs> she, she left a little crack in the door. And so I <laughs> wedged your way, right? wedged that one hit, hit full throttle. And pretty <laughs> soon they, uh, it was a it was a deal, and so we moving to Alaska. We had a mat, and the Lord was in it as well. We had a we were going to rent our house to a friend, and uh, we had a massive garage sale, which is also very liberating to sell everything oh, that yeah. you own. It's a yeah. spiritual experience. Um, and a lady <laughs> came up and said, "Oh yeah, you're moving to Alaska, great. Um, uh, what are you going to do with your house?" And we said, "Oh, I'm renting it to a friend." And she said, "Well, just out of curiosity, what uh, what would you sell it for?" And what were you going to sell it for? And I threw out a, you know, my sticker price, yeah. uh, retail. And she said, <laughs> MSRP. Yeah. And she said, uh, what if I were to give you cash? Okay. Yes. <laughs> let me think about uh, Let that. me call my friend. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And he was totally cool and said, yeah, you got to take it. So we sold yeah. our house, sold everything we owned, packed everything we owned up onto pallets and shipped them on a boat up into the middle of nowhere. And <laughs> I off, you know, I have to convince my kids to move off the grid. They have yeah. friends. How many kids do you have? Six children. Yeah. So they're very involved in multiple different things. And I basically said, I tell you what, I'll give you a thousand dollars each. <laughs> and For real? Yeah. Not, not cash, but you can buy a hobby stuff. So things that you can do because we're yeah. going to be living in the middle of nowhere with, you know, some, you, can't some just, time. you can't just go to, yeah. Yeah. And so. Got them all to sign off, and and so <laughs> that is the best thing so I've ever. Were budging? You had to throw in some money. Well, I didn't even sweeten the pot. Yeah, I just wanted I wanted to respect them. You know, sometimes as a dad, you know what's best for them, but yeah. can they see it in the moment? Yeah, that, especially as they get older, you want them to with the money there. They can see it now, right? Right. Yeah, yeah they're very tangible, <laughs> and so that worked out so well. My my kids ended up buying a lot of guitars and instruments and so for two years we played we all learned to play the guitar and got very involved in music and sang together as kid as a family and my have you dropped so, an album yet um <laughs> my one son has a lot of recording equipment and, yeah and he he does do a little bit of that so that's awesome let's do a mixtape tony yeah let's do it <laughs> yeah let's do it and so we'll my, give him a shout out drop his album <laughs> yeah my other son bought a boat and you know basically it was a car for a 15 year old who could go miles up the coast of alaska and bears and whales swimming around you and king salmon and 100 pound halibut you know oh, it, it was uh 
profound. That's pretty it's cool. Amazing. So did they like did they like it living in Alaska? They loved it. They, did. they loved it. It's an experience I'll never forget. They'll remember that the rest of their life and, and that's exactly the Lord was good to us there. We had a lot of time on our hands to just really so how many people in the village? Uh in the summer, it gets a little bit busier because com- some people fishing came stay in their cabin. Yeah, um, but I'd say about thirty-five people in the. Oh my goodness! So winter. how many people in the school? Um, we had fifteen. Six of them were mine. So you almost doubled the student body when yes. you went there, <laughs> right? But we did some amazing things. Um, we went to a remote island moose hunting for a week for school, wow. and camped out on this guy's boat and. Uh, we had drones and uh, made videos. We made promo videos yeah. um, and, and just had an, an educational experience that yeah. cannot be matched so, anywhere. So how many years were you there, you said? Two years. Two years. So you were in Oregon, which we'll get there for a, a minute, but right. was it harder for your kids to move from Oregon to Alaska or from Alaska now then to Michigan? Like, Did they fall in love with Alaska that it was harder for them to leave? Or did they have a harder time leaving Oregon? And how much money did it cost yeah. you to get them to move to Michigan? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's about 10, 12 grand to move. No, no, I'm saying how much did you have to pay the kids to oh. move the second time? <laughs> no, they were ready to go. They're a little bit like their dad. We got, you know, we were seeking. Yeah. And I can sell them pretty good. I'm, it, hey, yeah. you know what we could do? Yeah. And grandma lives there and yeah. you could play basketball. Yeah. And uh, uh, so. All that good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we built up trust with our kids that. Oh, all out of all of our moves, they can all see that every move was better mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. I mean, mm-hmm. everything's a blessing and a curse. There's good parts and bad parts of everything, no matter what you do. Yeah. And so, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. There's, yeah. there's all kinds of people in the world. So pointing them to the positive, um, it was harder to get them to move to Alaska. Yeah, to I'm sure. Back to Michigan. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's incredible. That's an incredible story. And uh, I'm sure that's an experience the kids will never, ever forget. Right. And I'm sure they'll revisit and go back to Alaska with their kids and right. tell stories of it that their kids won't believe and think they're exaggerating. So. Yeah, we made friends up there. So we have places to stay if we ever want to go up fishing you know i yeah. everyone i meet and that subject comes up they all say oh that's on my bucket list and yeah i'd love to go to alaska what i, what I want to say to is visit go, not to live go what yeah. are you waiting for i got, yeah. got, a, got a guy up there that would love to have visitors all you'd have to pay is your travel i tell them and yeah. i basically call their bluff and it, <laughs> it's interesting how we get so ingrained in our daily minutia of life that mm-hmm. we can't ever and I, you know i kind of have the mentality you have one life yeah Here's your one life. What, yeah. are you, what are you doing with your time? Are what, you enjoying experiences? Yeah. Yeah. Not that happy. You know, I heard a sermon one time uh, in the morning. It's Leah. Yeah. But no matter what you do, you know, you think, oh, if I, I'll work seven years and then the, right. no matter what you do in the morning, it's Leah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting perspective. Well, that's pretty cool. So, I, so let's go then back uh, before that. So you were in Oregon for how many years? Eight years. Eight years. And you were working in charter schools there. You were involved in education. Right. John uh, met, brother, a, yeah. met a lady who um, wrote grants to start charter schools. Mm-hmm. So um, we paid her to write a grant, and we got the grant for a half a million dollars to start a charter school. Mm-hmm. And so I moved out to Oregon in January of 2010, and... Stayed with my brother and his 12 children. I was in... <laughs> the 12 tribes of Vondo. Yeah, I had the bottom bunk in with Josiah and Levi. I got some great stories there, but I can't yeah. <laughs> share them all. Um, and we, John and I and one other person met in the office, and we just put together and built a school, you know, what? what yeah. we, and we figured there were 2,000 homeschoolers in the valley. If we got 200 of them, our budget would, would fly. The school yeah. would fly. And... It just exploded. I think we finished the first year with 350 students, and then over the course of eight years, we are at our capacity at 1,000 students. And so yeah. it was a customized, personalized learning homeschool, charter school, which is a public school, and it went really well, and it was great and awesome. We started two other charter schools out there, of which we kind of uh, manage right now, and then the Alaska opportunity came up. Yeah. All right, so... Alaska, or well, so Oregon, then Alaska. Now, you grew up here in Michigan. Yes. And you grew up here in the great state, in the mitten. And I know you were a Corona High School grad, played a little basketball and football yourself. 
I didn't know you guys back then, but I remember hearing the Vondolowski name. You'd, you'd read about it in the papers, different games. Uh, and I knew some people that went there, and they talk about these Vondo brothers. Uh, and it was a memorable name. And then when I met you guys, I, I realized why it was so memorable. You guys get the four Vondo brothers together, and it's it's an experience. It's on. It's, it's a ride. But um, So you went to Central Michigan University. What did you study in, in college? I always loved school. I went to um, Perry Baptist Christian School uh, when oh, I was right. young. That's right. I forgot about that. And did a little homeschooling. And then I went to Perry Middle School for a year, then Morris for two years, transferred to Corona in 10th grade. My parents kind of instilled in us <clears> this <throat> culture of improvement, and we were always looking to better ourselves and, and you know improve. We were very big into sports. That was yeah. probably an unhealthy um Maybe on the side of unhealthy, but we were big into it, and Corona had the best program yeah. anywhere around, so we moved to Corona. Um, and I always loved school. I always loved classes. I was kind of a class clown, but I but I knew where the boundary I was. Really, I yeah. knew. See, I didn't know where the boundary yeah. was. I was I was not kind of a class clown. I literally had three t- different teachers throughout my high school career. When we did like the awards night, you know, like the mm-hmm. banquet where they give people prestigious awards for mm-hmm. academics and athletics, I had teachers make up an award called the Class Clown Award, and I, my parents did not think that was funny at all. They were honored, but I didn't know where the border was, so right. yeah, I'm glad that you did. Uh, and so, you know, sports kept me in school. I love sports. I, I loved relationships and people. I'm very extrovert, and so. Uh, I don't know when I figured that I wanted to be a school administrator, but it's just kind of always where I wanted to do. So I went into teaching, fell in love with psychology and history, yeah. humanities. That was always kind of my, my passion. And I met my wife up at, in church up in central Michigan, and the journey began. So. Yeah. So you graduated Corona, class of 95? 93. 93. Okay. So that would have been my freshman year. Okay. And you were, you were like, as you just mentioned, you were somewhat of an athlete. Maybe a little, you said an unhealthy love for sports. But I remember seeing your guys' team in the Kerwood three-on-threes. We used to have here, right outside of the building we're in, some right. brawls. I mean, the Corona three-on-three, or the Kerwood three-on-three was legendary. People would come from all over the place to play in that thing. And I remember you guys playing. I don't, we never played against you because you were older than us. Right. But you guys had some bruisers on that team. Yeah, I, we that used to be the tournament. We played in Gus Mackers, stuff like that. But there was no competition quite like Kerwood. And yeah. I think they didn't even my, do it anymore. My buddy Ryan Tedoff will have to give it the stats. He keeps track of when we won and who we played <laughs> and what team we were on and who we beat. But Ryan, if you're watching, we need to send those stats in. Right. I think yeah. we won at least three or four years. It was it yeah was a big deal. We'd always recruit. We were always on the recruiting trail. Yeah. You know, we'd meet somebody up at Central or we'd meet somebody in the high school and we'd say, hey, what are you doing? June 5th. The first weekend of June. First weekend of June. Um, <laughs> you can stay with me. And yeah. we got Jason Ostapo from Chesnang. Yep. Ox, they called him, and he was dominant. Yeah. And, uh, of course, they had Josh McCarthy from Morris. and I don't know if we played in Kerwood with him, but, uh, yeah. Well, listen, I mean, in that tournament, we won a couple uh, also my my high school years. And we didn't go to the public school, so all of us, nice. we, we were – the Christian school kids, but we would recruit kids from other Christian sure. schools too. We did the same thing. We won two years. How many titles? Two years. Two. We, open men's division, high school. High school. Okay. Open high school. We yeah. we won one. Actually, that's right. We did win one men's division. One men's like, division. and I, I, it was it was uh, when I was nineteen, I think. So the year after high school. That's um, that's tough. That's tough. That's what, a good what, win. What we realized is, and it got less competitive over the years. Right. It really did. And like yeah. my boys played in it the last year they had it, which was two years ago. Yeah. I had my three sons, which are all different grades, but right. I just thought it'd be cool to have them all on the same yeah. team. And they ran it. Like, yeah. I mean, it was there wasn't a game that was even close. So the competition has really gone. I'm trying to tell them the legend of, you know, right. and they're like, that was not very <laughs> There was like six teams. I mean, it was like, it wasn't. It wasn't what it used to be. Someone needs to revive that. Yeah, we need to But, you know, rebuild. kids just aren't as competitive as they used to be. I you mean, think? I just, I don't think they are. I mean, they, you know. We were like winner, winner die, you know. Yeah, I mean, right. but it, you always needed to win that tournament. You needed a bruiser. You oh, had to, you had to have yes. a shooter. You had to have a or rebounder, two. but you had to have a guy that would just knock yeah. a guy into the pole. Oh, the fight was yeah. breaking out. You, Every you had somebody that had to knock somebody. If out. you didn't have a, a yeah. Rick Mahorn or a Bill Ambeer, yeah. you were you weren't going to win that tournament. So that was kind of my role. 
Like, oh, you know, yeah? Yeah, that yeah. was kind of my role. Your job was to go in and get their best player kicked out of the I game. I was the instigator, yeah, yes. Good. And there were okay. several times where I got uh, into some – Nice. Some heated moments. Good. Almost got kicked out of the tournament one year. You need the and, Mike Griffin, I always say that. Remember yeah. Mike Griffin and University of Michigan? Oh, yeah, yeah. Play, role yeah. player. Yes. Just, just did the dirty work. Well, if you ever watched the Bad Boys documentary where yeah. you t- Bill Lambeer just talks about his whole goal was to just get somebody flustered. Get, he goes, yeah. if I get Larry Bird kicked out of the game, he goes, right. that's a win for us. So, yeah, yeah that was kind of like the uh, the tournament. So, listen, we we, uh, I'll, I'll, we could talk about the three-on-three three forever. Yeah. But we have a segment on the show that we called Explain That Post. Okay. So we did a little deep dive on your social media. Wow. So Zach has uh, a post here that we're going to need a little more context. Sure. We're going to hand you the phone here. You're gonna, we're going to need you to explain this post and what was going on here in this moment. So tell us what's going uh, on in what this was picture. What talked about in this meeting? <laughs> Yeah. Like, what do you say to these people? Well, that's at the White House. So our audience can see this. So yeah. seriously, and that's this my, is at the real White House. Uh, this is a room at the airport in Southern Oregon. I got gotcha. you. So it's not the real Oval Office. And that looks like the Oval Office. I was hoping you'd say it was. So it's kind of like the Joe Biden Oval Office. I think it was my birthday, <laughs> and my team there. That's my cabinet at the charter school, and they rented this room. Uh, you know, they called me fearless leader and that kind of stuff. And so, yeah. I'm giving them to I'm t- assigning roles. I need you to take this guy out and get him kick, get Larry Bird kicked out of the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, I need you to give me the ball. Stop shooting the three. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it looks roles. like an intense speech you're giving there. I lo- like you know, State of the Union. One of the things I don't remember uh, what book I read it, and I think it's Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Have you read that by Patrick Lencioni? I have not. So you can read. It's a must you, read. You can Google it and just look at the pyramid. And it, it's very profound, but the concept is for teams to be successful, you can't fear conflict, and there's has to be passionate dialogue. Yeah. And so we would have uh, cabinet meetings, and it was, okay, put your ego aside. What's working? What's not? What should we do? And right. so there's no hopefully no fear of conflict there you could say what's on your mind and that's how you get better that's how you get people to speak up too yep, you yeah you got to call things out and candid and, conversations right yeah so passionate dialogue is something that what's the name of the book um five dysfunctions of a team i have to look that up it's it's really profound okay yeah so you were uh, having your moment there as el presidente yeah taking an opportunity there yeah, so it's my birthday. all right well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, as we close our episode here, let's talk a little bit about 2020. Okay. Um, so you took the job in the middle of a pandemic. Right. And uh, we weren't even sure if the school was going to open for in-person learning, I right. think, at the time. Um, but did, now, they had they hired you already before the lockdowns, or was was it all going on? So that would have been right middle about of the March. the same time. Right about okay. the same time. Uh, I was talking with the director. Uh, I don't remember the exact hire date, but it was around... May. Okay. Yeah. So we're so at that point, school had already been dismissed for the year. I think schools closed in mid March and never came back right. in the in the right. end of the twenty twenty season. And then when did you move back here? What was the June? So at that point, when you moved, were you certain or not that they were going to have school in person, or were you still on the fence? Uh, or were the, they still the on the fence? The way that say? everything worked out, it seemed like the Lord wanted us here and moved us here, and so I was confident that something would would work out if it yeah. wasn't here something would uh, present itself so uh, yeah um they had every intention you know which of us didn't think okay this can't last forever yeah. for crying out loud this right. is geez it's the flu uh but little did we know that it was going to take on a life of its own but, yeah uh, and it's been almost a year and in two right. weeks it'll be one year since the first shutdowns in michigan right yeah so and we just kind of fly under the radar and just do our thing. Do your own thing. Yeah, do yeah. our thing. And well, that's a nice thing about having a private school, right. Christian school. You're not funded by the government. Right. Uh, you know, uh, you can do kind of what you, you know, w- what we do at our school, and I know you guys do as well, is we leave a lot of what's going on with the students up to the parents. Yes. It's the parents have a choice. They're and not, loco parentis. Yes. In lieu of the parents we're working in. So, uh, so Springville then... They went home in uh, you know in April or March, like everybody else said. So, did you guys come back to in-person learning at the beginning of the school year? Yes. Okay. Full full on 
in person learning. So with yeah. with the kind of unique mix that you have of twenty five percent of your student body is mm-hmm. from out of state or from out of the area, um, how have you guys kind of navigated this tumultuous year of closed school, open school, closed school, open school, have sports, don't have sports, do all right. of these things? It's a little probably it's it's challenging enough when you're local, but when you have students that you're responsible for that maybe don't have their parents around, right. what did you guys kind of do to navigate through that? Huh. Wow. A lot of uh, prayer and conversations and what are our options? What is, you know, you're looking at what is the law? Is this really a law? Do we really have to do this? Can we do this? What can we do because we're a private school? And what do we, at, at the end of the day, we looked at our students and started with the conversation. Um, these are our children. And so right. it wasn't a hard conversation because it's our children. My own kids go there and we're going to do what's best for them. Yeah. That's kind of what we led with. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's uh, you know, that's, it's a, it's a tricky time to try to navigate it. And, and I think that philosophy of what you guys are doing is exactly what, you know, I think that we've, we've been at this, like I said, almost a year now. Yeah. At some point we have to allow people to make informed, educated decisions. Right. And we were right. at the hospital yesterday, even talking to the hospital staff about oh, this. Wow. And, you know, we were saying if if we know a year later that it has a 99.5% survival rate or three, right. 99.3, right. what's the goal? Right. Are we looking for 100%, 100% recovery to nobody get back? To, gets it anymore yeah, so, so I was asking them, like, what is the hospital's goal? Like, what are you looking for? And they're like, it's not really up to us. You know, we're kind of wondering, like, yeah. how much... You know, it's not like we're still in the stages where we don't know anything about it. Right. And uh, so that's the that's the tricky part. And so at some point, you just have to let people uh, kind of make, like I said, informed, educated decisions yes. and live their lives the way that they're going to live their lives and take the risks they're willing to take. And yeah, that's why I'm I've been in public school, taught in public school, started public schools, and I'm done with public schools. Yeah. You know, I'm not ever sending my kid there. Yeah. Um, the, the freedom that private school affords is so liberating for sure. And you know, the, no question about it. No. I mean, we've made the sacrifices for years to make sure our kids are in Christian school because to me, uh, there's a whole lot more to education than reading, writing and arithmetic. Right. Um, and, and so, yeah, so we appreciate, you know, what Springvale is doing and educating Great. kids. I love learning more about this uh, classical education. I've heard of it, and I've heard you even talk about it, but I wasn't 100% familiar with the concept. Um, and I know that's something that our school, Emmanuel, is trying to introduce more logic and reasoning in the high school level yeah, cool. than just – because, you know, we use the curriculum, a Becca book, which, uh, you know, is a pretty good it, good curriculum. It's college prep from high school and from sure. ninth grade on. But there is that still where, like, if you just memorize all the bold terms, yeah. you know, and so I know even for me, having gone through that, it does limit your ability to, not even your ability, your your uh, need to even have a thought to just kind of, well, if I can just memorize my way through this. And then once you get into real life, you're like, you can't memorize your way through things. Right. You kind of have to learn and yes. nobody's telling you what to think anymore. So, well, let me ask you this. So two things i want to know what are some exciting things going on at springvale right now that the community should know about and then i also want you to tell what's some good advice you would give to uh teachers faculty principals right now as they're kind of going through this situation uh well we just concluded on saturday night our fuel the flames fundraiser where i think we raised about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars wow we did like this variety program where students sang and um we had a comedian and we did art uh, auctioned off art it was just like basically a lawrence welk style variety <laughs> yeah. show that we did online and it, it's really quite amazing what they were able to pull off camera wise i mean we had some glitches and where can it, people see that it's on our Facebook page, okay. Springvale uh, Facebook page. It's still up there. We did a, I did a little motivational speaker oh, nice. clip. We did a Da Bears. <laughs> da Bears. Da Beards. Da Beards. We did Da Beards. Uh, so we did some, you know, comedy, some comedy sketches comedy stuff. Uh, have to check so those that out. was that was the biggest thing. And now we're starting up into recruitment season, both uh, for our boarding program. We have a traveling music. Uh, group called sound and mm-hmm. they travel they're going to go on the west coast this year uh, visiting churches 
and recruiting teenagers who might be interested in uh, joining our boarding program. That type of education. And yeah. then we're seeking to market to uh, the local community. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I came back here after 25 years, 20 years being gone, and want to provide the oh. education I wish was available when I went here. Yeah. Uh, and so just getting the word out to, to families who are looking for something different in the area of education. Well, good. Well, this is an opportunity for you to tell our listeners who are mostly local yeah. where they can find out more information about, uh, look right into that camera there and tell sure. them how they can find out more information about Springvale. Our website, springvale.us, is a good way to start. Uh, you could certainly give us a call or look us up on Facebook, uh, and we, I'd be happy to give you a tour. We have a 140-acre campus. And so lots of buildings, we have a gymnasium, and really I think we're the best kept secret in Shiawassee County yeah. for Christian education. So those would probably be the best two ways. Well, check them out, uh, Springvale, and uh, we've had always had a good relationship with them and utilizing their facilities and different things. And, uh, of course, we love Joe. So, well, I know I kind of alluded to this, but, you know, right now um, one of the, the last uh, industries – that has not fully gone back to work is teachers and yeah. schools. And what I'm being told by a lot of, uh, you know, local politicians is that a lot of the school boards and teachers are not comfortable going back right now because they think, you know, students coming in spreading a virus and they feel unsafe. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess what would be your advice as a, as an educator, <laughs> as an educator, as a, school principal obviously i know some people are limited by what their district will allow right but what would be some encouraging words you could give to educators out there about maybe the impacts of virtual learning that's mm -hmm. having on a student as opposed to in-person learning right so we manage two charter schools out yeah. in oregon we're going out there on friday heading out there to um, meet with everybody to do what you're talking about I, I think it's it's the same things you know there's a book seven habits of highly effective people yep and uh, those principles come to mind. Be proactive. Uh, begin with the end in mind. Sharpen your saw. Yeah. Uh, build synergy. Uh, seek to understand, then to be understood. Those, those are principles that are timeless truths yeah. that apply in every situation um, to bring about healthy results. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Well, I, uh, I appreciate what you're doing here. I'm glad to have you back in the community. Good to be here. Glad to yes. have you guys. Hopefully next year our schools will be able to do a little competition against each other. That'll be yeah. fun, local, local you know, rivalry. I, I am very competitive, mm -hmm. but I also want every school to do well. Yeah. I want the public school to do well. Mm -hmm. I want Emmanuel Baptist and Life in Christ and all the private schools to do well because I believe that when a community values education, it's good for everybody yeah. and healthy Alternatives, healthy options are, are good for everybody because we can be a lot of things to a lot of people, but we can't be all things to all people. Right. And certain people right. uh, have specific needs and, you know, one school, one size doesn't fit all. Yeah. Well, listen, if you're if you're liking what you've heard today in regards to education, classical education, there's a great option for that here locally. Springvale Christian Academy. Look them up. We gave you the information. We put the link in the description here. So take a chance and look them up. And, and Joe, thank you so much for being on the show. Great but before we let you go, yes. we're going to do our favorite segment of the show, which okay. we call Say It in 60. Say It in 60. So we're going to give you 10 questions in 60 seconds. Okay. We have a little spinning wheel here that I'm going to pull up on my phone. You're going to actually play for some fabulous prizes. All right. Push that button right in the middle. The middle button. And then you're going to find out what you're playing for. Tell him what he's won. Myrtles. Myrtles chocolates. Have you been to Myrtles? I've not. Oh, so it's a, it's a uh, local right downtown. Nice. They make uh, handmade chocolates, candies, treats, brownies. I mean, it's amazing. Your kids will love it. Your wife will love it. Maybe cool. you get a good gift for your wife. Yeah. But you got to answer all ten of these questions in sixty seconds in, 60 in seconds. order to win that prize. Are you ready? Is there a timer? Zach's gonna have there a timer. We'll, time. okay. we'll, keep, we'll keep you up to date on okay. the timer. Okay. Okay. So even more than you get them right, you just have to answer right, something. Yeah. And they're all your answers, so right, okay. there's no wrong answer. Okay. Can't wax 60 eloquent. seconds. No, you can't. Okay. Well, you, you can if you're quickly. If I don't want the myrtles. quick about it. <laughs> yes. All right. Your time starts now. What is a must-read book? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. What is a daily habit that everyone should do? Pray and read your Bible. What is your favorite podcast? AZ Business Solutions. 
must have been shown on, on TV. I don't have a TV. Uh, we did do um, the uh, Mandalorian. Oh, oh yes. That's a good one. What is your why? Six children. 30 seconds left. What's your best piece of advice? Seek to understand, then to be understood. Wow. Quote? Uh, quote. Young men overestimate what they can do in five years and underestimate what they can do in 20 years. Who you look up to? George Washington. Have his what does success look like to you? Five seconds left. Uh, culture of continual improvement. He got it with he one got second it. left. With ah! one second to spare. You didn't right choke at the there. end like There's our basketball team. Too. There's some great answers. And you didn't choke like our basketball didn't team choke. did. So well, <laughs> good job. So culture of continual improvement. You know, they have room to room to build on. Always That's room success. to grow. Always yeah. To grow. No, listen, there's always a lesson to be learned in second place. And uh, so yeah. anyways, well, Joe, thank you so much for being on the show. Any Appreciate final it. words for our audience here? No, I love yeah. the love the program. Appreciate the questions you ask, yeah. and uh, look forward to. We appreciate having you here. We wish you all the success, all the best, and uh, continue keeping it up and educating our children. And uh, again, if you're still watching, thank you for joining us. As my mother always said, you can't and never could until you tried. So go out there and try something great, my friends, and don't take the easy way out. We'll see you next time.